All right. So my name is uh, Brandon Falk. Uh, I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about some of the things that I've done throughout my career in computer security. I specialize in binary security. And what I mean by that is effectively most of the targets I've looked at, I've usually not had source for. I've had source for a decent amount of targets, but a lot of them I haven't had source for. So a lot of the tools I'm going to talk about are to apply some of these fuzzing techniques to, to things without source. Um, this was my Halloween picture of this year, if anyone knows what that's from. No one? No one? <sighs> okay, okay. It's uh, Luna Lovegood from Harry Potter. So she had this like big line hat and I was just re-watching Harry Potter like a month ago and I, I just wanted the hat. So anyways, um, pretty much all that I have focused on in my computer security career has been harnessing. And we'll kind of go into a little bit more about what I mean when I say harnessing. But effectively, it's I'm trying to gather coverage like AFL gathers. I'm trying to observe when crashes happen. I'm trying to reset the program to uh, a predefined state you know, before the input is processed, so on and so forth. Um, I'm on Twitter, and I just started a blog like a month and a half ago, which I'm trying to update once a month. Um, and also, I have a YouTube channel that I update about every year and a half. So I'm going to start off with talking a little bit about what fuzzing is. How many people in here are familiar with fuzzing? OK, decent amount. So effectively, fuzzing is a, a way of trying to find computer security issues, or even more broad, find issues in general. So it's often used when you're looking for file format bugs. That's something you see a lot with the public tools out there. You see uh, things like AFL, where they can take inputs, create, create new files, and then it tries to load the file in the program and see how the program behaves when that file is loaded. Uh, fuzzing is really easy. Like To just fuzz something basically means you have to use the program and provide it some input in whatever form that that program expects for input. Um, it's pretty simple. You, just, you can spin it up on your laptop. You can spin it up kind of wherever you want. Um, there are kind of two different ways that people typically fuzz. Uh, people usually use generators or mutators. Generators are usually when you write some program that is able to create input files for you. And then mutators are kind of when you have existing files that you want to just change aspects of. You have an image and you want to change different pixels and different values of the image, uh, but you already have an image. You're not making a new one from scratch. So, Fuzzing has kind of an issue of it can only really look for these exceptional conditions in a program. And these are typically exceptions or crashes or you know, when you get the pop-up on Windows like this program stopped responding. And fuzzing basically can only look for those things unless you enlighten it and teach it to look for other, other things. So I've got this little slide that just kind of shows you're just generating random things. In this case, it's just random words from a dictionary. So kind of the common process that you go through when you're fuzzing is, like I said, you have two different ways. You're either generating inputs or you're using existing inputs. Usually you mutate both of them, regardless of if you have a generator or not. You feed it into the program. You get a crash out. And then once you have the crash, you go through, you figure out what actually caused the issue. You, know, you, you go to the developer. You sell the bug you know, whatever your intent is for that bug. So fuzzing has a lot of limitations. And kind of going to go through some of these issues and how I've remedied them throughout this whole presentation. So when you're looking at a program, you don't really necessarily know what that program expects. You maybe know, oh, it's a, it's a web browser. So it expects, you know, over the network, it's expecting some HTML or some HTTP, which then contains HTML, which contains CSS and images and all these things. But it can get more difficult when you're looking at things of what about Chrome having custom extensions to the browser that it handles weird protocols or different file formats that aren't traditionally expected. So you have to try and figure out how those things work. And on binary targets, you're usually going to have to reverse that information out, figure out what the program actually does. So, Another big issue with fuzzing is, as I kind of mentioned before, fuzzing typically looks for these exceptional conditions, these crashes. And if you have a program that just 
reads an arbitrary file and allows you to leak secrets off of a machine, it's likely a fuzzer isn't going to detect that because it didn't cause a crash. It didn't cause an exception. Further, this could get even crazier if you have something where it's just like, it just gives you root for some reason. Like something you do gives you root. As long as it doesn't crash, fuzzer's probably not going to find it unless you teach the fuzzer or whatever environment you're in to tell you something interesting happened. Uh, the other issue with fuzzing is reproducibility can be a pain. You end up with fuzzing a browser, you sent thousands of web pages through it, and then eventually it crashes. And then you run the last web page that you sent through, and it doesn't crash because all of a sudden, all the 999 previous inputs somehow affected the state of the program. And finally, a lot of the conventional off-the-shelf tooling that you can get now, just go online and find these fuzzers, they require source, which is a pretty big limitation um, unless you're looking at open source projects or you're at a big company where you have source to whatever your, your target is. So I'm going to talk a little bit about harnessing, which is what I specialize in. Uh, it's not really a real thing to specialize in. It's not like I have a master's in harness. It's just some made up thing that, that I claim. So effectively, the harness is what I consider to be the thing that is watching over the program. It's looking for the crashes. It's gathering that information about unique uh, behaviors that the new inputs caused. Um, it's usually resetting the program. It's trying to figure out everything that's going on of the target under test. So we're going to talk a little bit about some of the common tools out there. Um, I guess some of the examples of common tools out there. Uh, first, pretty much the simplest way that you can fuzz something is literally just start running the program. It, this is nothing special. This is why fuzzing is so great and so simple. Of If you want to fuzz an image parser, just put an image on the disk and double click the image and congratulations, you're kind of fuzzing. Now just do it in a loop and now you're actually fuzzing. So you need something that can create this mutated file in some form, whether it's a generator or a mutator, as we talked of before. And once you're running the application, if you're getting crashes, you're kind of winning. So it can get kind of difficult in terms of when you're just running an application, what you do if you get crashes. So you can attach a debugger and try and save the state or capture the state of the application when it crashed. But in a lot of cases on like embedded targets, you don't really get this option and it just silently reboots or, or something like that. If you've ever been using your phone or something and all of a sudden it goes black and then the boot screen comes up, it likely had a kernel panic and there's not much you can extract from there, maybe a text log file somewhere. So with this kind of environment of running an application, reproducibility is really, really, really a big issue. Uh, kind of with the browser example I brought up before, you don't really know if it was your input or your input plus previous inputs or what, what the state was that, that created this issue. Um, so scaling can also be another issue here is say you have a browser, it's pretty hard to open multiple instances of a browser. You can make more and more tabs, but they're not really isolated instances. They're all kind of forked from the same environment. Or even worse, if you have applications that refuse to run multiple versions. Say they have, uh, say you have some database on disk and it's locked and you can only run one instance of an application. Now if you want to fuzz this effectively, you probably need to make a VM for every core on your system and scale out that way. Um, and finally, when you're just running the program, you also run into serious startup issues. So like Word takes, I don't know how long, five seconds to open, 20 seconds to open, depending on the file. And if you're trying to fuzz something like that and you're double clicking a file or you have a script that's opening these files for you, you end up spending a lot of your time just waiting for the application to start. So that kind of, kind of takes us to a real tool out there, which is AFL. I think most people are probably familiar with AFL if you're familiar with fuzzing. Anyone use AFL before? OK. And anyone heard of AFL who hasn't used it? OK. So AFL is kind of this tool that I guess came out in 2012, 2013, and it really revolutionized the way that a lot of fuzzing was done in the public community. And it did this because it added code coverage, which is something we're going to talk in detail a little bit more, but effectively it allowed uh, 
when you compile an application, AFL provides these like compiler extensions that will add in hooks to figure out uh, what new code you have hit. So you have all of this different code. You have a browser that has millions of different things it can do. You run an input through, and it records what uh, parts of the program were kind of activated when uh, your input went through. And this allows you to learn, hey, this new input that I created did something new and unique, and so on and so forth. And it's really important for uh, finding which inputs are good and worth keeping around. And then further, you can feed those back later. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. So in standard configuration, uh, AFL requires source because the hooks that it puts in for gathering code coverage uh, are compiled in. However, you can run it with QMU. There's a bunch of forks of AFL that work on different targets, work on Windows, work on kernel targets. And they're just kind of all out there. But AFL as a core pretty much fundamentally relies on having source, um, but kind of works with QMU. So, What's kind of replacing AFL right now is something called libfuzzer, which is part of the LLVM project, which is part of, uh, well, Clang is part of the LLVM project, which is just another compiler out there. So what's really neat about this is you're able to, um, fun, like, you're able to build applications directly with Clang. And since this is made by the same team that makes Clang, everything kind of integrates easily. And you get these AFL style hooks that are a lot cleaner. If I remember correctly, someone might have to correct me on this, I think AFL like object dumps to get the disassembly of the program and then does like regex parsing to inject the hook. So it's really, really kludgy. Libfuzzer does it a lot cleaner. Uh, it's also a lot faster as it's built into the application that you're, you're testing. Uh, <coughs> AFL does have a mode kind of like that called persistent mode. But effectively, it, it bakes it in. It'll call a function over and over with a different input. Everything's in memory, so it's a lot faster. Whereas AFL typically relies on creating a file, saving that to disk, and then having a program load that file from disk. And it's just causing a lot of disk activity. And turns out you're spending $1,000 a month in, in hard drives because they keep failing. So uh, now I'm going to kind of talk about the big things for fuzzing as a whole. Uh, none of these are really tool specific. They're just generic things that most fuzzing tools do now, um, or hopefully all fuzzing tools will do in the future. So both AFL and libfuzzer introduce kind of a concept called coverage guided fuzzing. And this is when you're analyzing what the program under test is actually doing. So in this case, I have kind of this graph. And I'm colorblind, so that doesn't really help. I don't know if I can point. But so I think it's a green line, but it's the lowest line, uh, is effectively telling you the amount of coverage over the number of fuzz cases on the uh, x-axis. And the x-axis, in this case, is a logarithmic scale. And we can see that there are three lines that are significantly above that line and hit the same points about an order of magnitude sooner. And those three instances are different coverage-guided fuzzers, whereas the bottom line is not using this coverage guidance. And the reason this is important is you, if you're not gathering the co coverage of the application, the only feedback you're really getting is, did it crash, did it not crash? And coverage adds this kind of gradient to the problem of, did it crash, did it not crash? And then all these things in between, how much code did you cause to get hit? How much of that is new code? How much of this, this code is, is you know, maybe older code or, or you know, never been hit before by your fuzzer? So typically, to get this feedback model, uh, you're gathering the coverage of figuring out what code is actually invoked. And then once you find that you hit new code, you save the input that caused you to reach that new code. And that's going to allow you to come back to that input later and use it again as a foundation for, for future fuzz cases. So you end up going down a path where you have a 1% chance of hitting this unique rare piece of code. And you end up hitting it. You save it off. And now if you were to run that input through, you're always going to hit that rare code path. And now you can look for another unique code path right uh, below it. So I actually did a presentation on just different ways of gathering code coverage itself. Uh, I have a link to that at the end of the slides, which I'll try to distribute or find whichever way I can do that. 
But I talk about all these different ways you can gather coverage. Um, typically, instrumenting at compile time is the most standard way. It's what AFL does. It's what libfuzzer does. I'm sure people are doing it with custom tools and manually. There's probably dozens of tools out there to do things like this. The next step is you can use an emulator. You can use something like QMU. You can use, um, I guess, how many other emulators are there? There's Box, there's QMU, there's, that, there, there aren't too many popular ones, unless you're doing gaming. Um, but in that case, since everything's being emulated, you can just hook the main loop that's going through and decoding the instructions and, and running through the application, and you can figure out what code's being run because it's lifting that application. It's actually running it. So you can quickly just add a little stub in there and update some dictionary of saying, oh, I hit this code, I didn't hit this code, so on and so forth. <laughs> Next, you can kind of cheat. It's not perfect, but you can just randomly sample. You can just, like, every 1,000 times a second, break into the application, record where it currently is, let it continue on. And you can do this with just a standard debugger. You can do this with custom debuggers. You can do this with interrupts if you're looking at kernel level. Um, and this is probably the most versatile way of gathering coverage, but it's also lossy. You know, if you're on that rare path, there's a chance that that one in a thousand times a second that you're, you're gathering that information, you're never going to actually observe that you're in that location of the code. Finally, uh, processors are kind of starting to add these new features. Intel just added something called processor trace which is meant to kind of give you a stream of all of the things that the processor has been working on so you can get that coverage information uh, back directly from the processor. AMD had some undocumented feature that I found referenced in some like 2008 paper. Uh, some people just brute forced these different register states in the CPU and found that it started spewing coverage data to some physical address. Um, so I actually use that in my, in my hypervisor, and I talk about that a lot in that, uh, talk about it a lot more in that presentation. But it's kind of weird that it exists. It's also very slow, but it's, it's cool. Um, anyways, with that coverage, uh, like you saw in the graph before, you usually get an order of magnitude of time improvement, so like time to same coverage. So you're running through the application, and you hit 10,000 unique you know, let's say lines of code. And that might have taken an hour to hit. When you're running coverage guided fuzzing, usually you'll hit that same level about 10 times faster. That's a ballpark number and it varies a lot by the target. Further, you usually get more coverage in general as a whole with this coverage guided fuzzing. So this I would say is probably the most important thing you can do if you have the ability to gather this, this coverage information. And I think all the fuzzing tools we see from this point on will, will have this ability. So we ha I'm going to introduce this like fake little program. It's just going to remove the from any sentence. It's pretty simple, N nothing, nothing fancy here. So this is kind of showing what this coverage thing does. So we have these random inputs going through. We find out that once we hit this new code, these new branches, we save the input and build upon it. And we're able to find this kind of unique path. That it, the odds that we generate four completely random words that happen to be the cow jumped over, which is this crashing case of this application, uh, it would pretty much never happen. It's the dictionary to the fourth power, right? Which is, a, I think, a decent size number. But if you're doing coverage guided fuzzing, you typically can turn the exponent into a, a linear function. So now you're looking at the dictionary times four. Because you're you have a random chance of getting the first word right, then you find that you gathered new coverage from that, you save that input, you build upon it, you do it again, so on and so forth. This is not perfectly clean like that mathematically, and this assumes you're only building upon an input, and usually you're building upon any input in that set. But this is effectively how it works, and it's awesome. So this is kind of an uh, improved model of what I showed before, but this is for when you're doing feedback and this like coverage guided fuzzing. In this case, we're generating uh, inputs again. We're gathering you know, from wherever on the internet all of these inputs, unique files, unique internet traffic, network traffic. We're mutating that, feeding it to the program, but now we kind of have a bunch of different paths. If it crashes, we have triage and report. 
but we also are going to take that crash, we're going to save it off and potentially use it for a future input. Now this can be a big issue if you end up just having all of your inputs be crashes because crashes usually are pretty expensive because you can maybe do a bunch of fuzz cases on an application while it's running. You know, for example, you can start up a browser and you can refresh the page over and over and run new JavaScript through it. But once it crashes, the whole browser goes down, you got to start a new instance and so on and so forth. Um, but we also have another case here, which is we have a coverage path. And this is the program doesn't crash, but it just finds new code. You save off that input that created that, you feed it back through, and now you'll mutate, mutate and build on that again. And further, you'll build these like coverage reports. There's not a technical name for it, it's just what I put up there. But it's effectively saying what code you have hit. And you usually use this to either cover, uh, color uh, an IDA graph or some program for analyzing binaries, or color whatever your coding environment is, if it's VS Code or Vim or whatever, to highlight the lines that your fuzzer hit. And when you look through this information, you can kind of see, oh, I never hit this function, I never hit this parser, all of these things are missing, all these edge cases and error cases I'm not hitting. And that can kind of, as a human, tell you what your fuzzer is not doing. And you can go back and make tweaks and improve your fuzzer and your mutators and so on and so forth. So. Good, everyone good on, on feedback and code coverage? So now I'm gonna talk about something else which I call crash amplification. It's kind of a completely made up thing. I don't think there's an actual term for it, but it's effectively trying to find ways that you can increase the, the not necessarily probability, but the frequency in which erroneous cases in a program cause a crash. And the most common way of doing this is ASAN, which is address sanitizer. Once again, part of LLVM, which, uh, who, is, who is responsible for libfuzzer and clang and all these different things. And effectively, when you're running an application, you're able to go out of bounds in C and C++ willy-nilly, and nothing really cares. In modern day, you have heap cookies and stack cookies, which will usually raise an exception if you go way too far out of bounds. But if you just go like one byte out of bounds, usually it just doesn't matter. And if they're reads, you can usually go pretty far out of bounds because nothing's really detecting that your read went out of bounds. So ASAN, uh, also Windows has page heap, which is built in. And electric fence is kind of an old school style ASAN. No one really uses it anymore because ASAN's just better. Um, but you're able to rebuild your application with these ASAN hooks and it's now going to monitor all the memory axes and it will make sure that if you allocated 37 bytes of memory and then you accessed th the 38th byte of that memory, it will end up crashing and raising this exception. So it kind of has this ability to find things that are slightly out of bounds, wouldn't actually cause a crash on the real target because it isn't off of a whole different page of the architecture. Um, but you get these crashes, you get this feedback, and you find out these tiny little errors in the program. Further, when I kind of mentioned the limitations of fuzzing, I mentioned that there are a lot of things that you can miss. So one thing that you can do here is try to add hooks for whatever your target is to figure out um, different interesting cases. So if you're looking at a network protocol like SSH or something where you're authenticating into a server or into a client, doesn't really matter, Maybe you should add a path on the authentication success uh, path where it crashes. And this will cause it to you know, create this crash, create this interesting event that a human will look at later if it ever successfully authenticates. And if you're using a fuzzer and you set up a strong password on your, uh, on your protocol or whatever you're fuzzing and you get an authentication success, it probably was a bug that caused that to happen. And we've seen this a couple of times. I think in 2006 or 2007, there's a big uh, real VNC, which is like a remote desktop thing, uh, <laughs> bug that allowed you, the server's like, how would you like to authenticate? And you're just like, I wouldn't. And it's like, cool, you're in. And you just kind of tell it what you want to do. Uh, I think in, geez, 2013 or 2014, Windows had a similar issue where it's the server asks you, how would you like to authenticate? And you're like, how about a CRC32? Which is not a crypto algorithm at all. It's just like something to verify the integrity of something. And it's four bytes, so it doesn't take too long to go through. So, and then I think just a few months ago, uh, was it libssh, like last month, 
uh, libssl that had this same sort of issue where you just say like, ah, I don't want to auth or roughly that's kind of how it worked. So it's important to understand in your specific target what you're actually looking for and, and trying to find as an error case. And in that case, getting authentication without a password is kind of an issue. So uh, when I was talking about being able to do things radically outside of the scope of your actual buffers that you're supposed to be working in, a perfect example is Super Mario Land on, the, I think, the Game Boy, where you could clip out of bounds of the level and you could literally explore the RAM of the cartridge and, I guess, the, the device, the Game Boy itself, and go through and break blocks. So this is a picture of going through random parts of memory as if they're part of the map, and you can go through and break blocks. What's interesting here is that it doesn't really crash right away. Even though you're updating and changing this memory, it usually takes 15 to 20 seconds to crash, which is a pretty long time in a tiny piece of RAM where all of the values have been perfectly programmed to be very specific and have a lot of this meaning. And it turns out this kind of carries over to real computers even more, because you have more RAM. If you were to take your browser and attach a debugger and randomly start smashing over memory, it's probably going to take a lot more smashing than you expect to cause it to actually crash. And that's why this sort of stuff is really important. Uh, adding ASAN to your, to your project, which requires source again, will really help using things like Electric Fence and PageHeap. Don't require that you have that source, uh, but still kind of get you roughly the same amount of granularity. Um, they won't give you byte, one byte out of bounds, but they'll give you 16 byte out of bounds. Um, the next thing you can do for fuzzers is just performance. Make them faster. I think, I think this one's pretty simple. Um, linear scaling is really important. When I say linear scaling, I mean scaling the application to use all of the cores of your system or multiple systems. But the linear part is really important here that you have to actually be gaining the benefit. You're running it on 100 cores. Hopefully, you're getting 100x the speed. So in a lot of cases, People think their stuff just scales because they can run multiple instances. And little do you know, they're all smashing the file system. And you're not actually getting 100x speed up. You're getting a 2x speed up. So it's really important to kind of monitor that performance behavior of whatever you're fuzzing. That being said, this is kind of the last thing you should look at. It's you should worry about making a good fuzzer and having good inputs and having a good target before you really get into this tweaking and, and <laughs> sticking your tongue out at the right angle. And I think the final thing I want to talk about for uh, fuzzing improvements as a whole is something called snapshot fuzzing, which is relatively rare in this kind of like public space. No one's really doing it. There aren't many tools for it. But it's effectively taking an application, generating a, a core dump on it if you're on Linux, or generating a mini dump which is effectively just the state of memory and registers, the whole CPU state of the application, saving it off somewhere, loading it back up, and resuming execution from that point. And this gives you some pretty awesome abilities. One, you get determinism, which is a big issue in most of fuzzing as a whole. Since you're running from the same location uh, of the application, or the exact same memory state and register state, unless your emulator or hypervisor or whatever you're doing snapshot fuzzing in has a bug, you should always get the same results every time you feed the input through. So if you have some crazy input that grooms the heap in some certain way, does all of these operations, and then finally sends through something that causes a crash, you can run the same input through again, and you'll observe the same crash again. And now you can look through and analyze this. And this reproducibility might sound boring and lame, but this is one of the biggest issues, especially that you see uh, at big corporations who are trying to do fuzzing. They end up doing all this fuzzing, and s someone creates this report, creates this ticket saying, hey, I found this bug in the program. And the developer's like, OK, how do I observe it myself? How do I run that input through and get the crash? And the answer is usually, oh, run this program for like three hours. It worked on my machine. And then a lot of cases, it doesn't work, because your machine's slower, configured differently, all of these different things. And then the developer, you know, one week later, frustrated, just says, like, I'm not going to fix this because I can't actually see what this bug is. And this is a huge issue. So determinism is really big. 
Uh, it's not really a huge issue if you're looking at small things like image parsers, but when you're looking at browsers, when there's so much state and so many things going on and multiple threads operating, it's usually pretty common that bugs will just not reproduce. So the other nice thing about snapshot fuzzing is since you're running these things in kind of isolated applications or emulators or hypervisors or whatever, you can just run as many as you have cores. So it scales really nicely. You get all these performance benefits. And uh, this is effectively what I use for all of my tooling since like 2013. So now I'm going to talk about roughly what I have done throughout my career in cybersecurity, which started in approximately 2012 and is continuing to this day, unless I got fired or something. But when I started off, uh, I was kind of tasked with writing fuzzers, as most people do when you're trying to find bugs. I wrote an SVG fuzzer, which is an image file format that's text-based. It looks kind of like XML. You can do JavaScript in it. It's really weird, but all the browsers handled it. Um, I also looked at a Chrome DOM fuzzer, so trying to find JavaScript or different interactions with the browser that, that cause these crashes. Both of them were terrible and didn't work at all. So I basically had this like realization, wow, fuzzing really sucks, when I didn't realize that I just sucked at fuzzing. So uh, at the time, and especially now, but back in 2012, Symbolic was starting to pick up, which is the basically taking an application, creating a mathematical expression of what that application is doing, and then trying to solve for different things. You find out the application uh, takes one input value, which is x, it adds 2 to it, and then if it's equal to 10, then the program crashes. And when you're doing symbolic execution, you're able to take that expression and figure out, oh, if you have x equals 8, I think I said plus 2, uh, equals 10, great, now you have a crashing input. That can get really hard as the equations get really large, but this was something that at the time I thought was going to be the future and hasn't necessarily panned out yet, but people are doing good work on it and it's getting better over time. So then I got tasked with looking at Chrome Sandbox, which is basically the IPC layer between the Chrome renderer, which is like where your web pages sit, your JavaScript is running, and the Chrome browser, which is the thing that handles all of Chrome. So if you crash the renderer, you get the all snap page, you get the thing, you know, whatever the frowny face saying, oh, this tab crashed. And when you crash the browser, all of Chrome crashes. The whole thing comes down, all your tabs go down. And this sandbox was created, I can't remember when Chrome introduced it, but effectively it allowed you to potentially find a vulnerability and get an exploit in a single tab. And you still don't really have any access to anything on the system because that program, that application or thread, has been removed of basically all of its system level privileges, you know, access to disk, access to network, all of these things. So uh, what you typically need to do if you want to write a full chain exploit to exploit a browser is you need to somehow get out of that sandbox. And that's what I looked at doing. And since this, um, since this layer between the browser and the renderer is supposed to be secured, they're not passing pointers along. They're not passing this critical system information across. Everything's serialized into not really JSON. It's like binary JSON. So it's creating what actually, uh, say, it'll make a dictionary, but it will flatten it out in memory, pass along, so on and so forth. So the sandbox was literally designed for security. It wasn't there for some performance benefits or any usability benefits. It's entirely there for security. So they tried to make sure that it does as little as possible. So it, the more attack surface you have, the more likely that you're going to be able to find some exploitable issue in it. Um, so what was really difficult about Chrome Sandbox is since it's this IPC mechanism handled in pipes kind of behind the scenes, it's really hard to get inputs in. All the conventional tools, I think it was just like AFL at the time, relied on getting things from the uh, from disk from a file. And in this case, it wasn't reading things from a file. It was having this communication over this pipe or kind of like a network socket. So further, there is really no trivial way to figure out what it was actually communicating unless you figure out how Chrome works or write generators or things like that. Uh, at this time, I was trying to write a mutator, so I needed to find uh, 
real data of, of real traffic that goes across this IPC channel. So I wrote a custom debugger, and it sounds like some people here are writing custom debuggers, so that's a really good way to go. Um, I wrote a custom debugger for Windows that effectively would just attach to the Chrome browser process. It would put a breakpoint on where the read file routine returned from where it read from that pipe and read that serialized data, and I would just log that information. I'd save, here's what it read, here's the length of what it read, and I built this corpus or database of all these different inputs um, that I've seen go across that channel. And this allowed me to start building this um, statistic model of how many of the different IPC messages I was able to hit. So in, in the case of Windows, I think it was like 800 different IPC types that could go over this, this message passing or bus, whatever you want to call it. Um, and I was able to watch that number grow. So as I started the browser, you saw just launching the browser caused 120 of these unique messages. And then going to Facebook caused it to go to 200 unique messages. And going to YouTube and going to Flash pages and doing all these things brought it up to 300. And you kind of had to fight and find all of these features that the browser had to cause this traffic to go up, to find these new things that the browser is supposed to do. So once I had this this corpus of all of these inputs, um, I was going to fuzz and mutate these things and try and corrupt them, but I just started feeding them through as they were. Just old data that I'd seen in a previous browsing session, pass it through this session, and it turned out it really broke Chrome. So this was back in about 2013, so it doesn't work like this anymore, but back then just feeding through old traffic found a lot of bugs in Chrome IPC without any sort of corruption. And the reason for this is there's a lot of state there. And I would capture a message from an old session that was trying to uh, read from a file that had been opened with a previous message. And since in this state, I never opened the file, I was just reading from it, it behaved strangely, it just tried to start using old data. Uh, a lot of these cases were uninitialized memory usages and use after freeze, because they're almost all stateful issues. Uh, further, I did my Chrome IPC research on Windows. Uh, it was pretty obvious at the time that almost all of the Chrome IPC fuzzing was done on Linux. I think it still is, because almost any Windows-specific IPC message was terrible. I, I think I remember like the clipboard, you could just effectively say, hey, give me just 32K. And it, it was like, oh, OK, here you go. Here's whatever clipboard contents you thought you wanted, and it's just random stuff off the heap. So that was pretty awesome. Eventually later when that stopped working, I think in 2014, uh, I had to add corruption and then it worked for another year and then it stopped working. So that's kind of the, the beauty of the security industry is every time you do something that works, it stops working a year after and then you make it work again and then it stops working a year after. So it kind of sucks. But after being brought down by my crappy SVG fuzzer and my crappy Chrome DOM fuzzer, uh, I finally started to realize, huh, maybe fuzzing does actually work. And in this particular case, I was trying to justify it because I still hated fuzzing in my head, but I'm like, oh, I'm not fuzzing, I'm harnessing. Which is just a lie, I'm still just fuzzing. But what's pretty cool about this is I found a lot of Chrome IPC bugs. I didn't really read much Chrome code. I didn't understand how Chrome would work. I didn't know how the IPC messages worked, except for basics of like where the lengths were and where the message types were. Um, I just really had no idea what I was actually looking at, but I was still able to get a decent amount of crashes. This is some random file. The, the image was a random file of some of the crashes that I had in Chrome, I don't know, 2015 or something like that. I don't really know what these things mean anymore, but I know that the low means that it's basically a null DREF and the C0005 uh, without the low is basically indicating that it's accessing invalid memory in some higher region of, of memory, which is usually a weird trash. In this case, they're pretty much all use after freeze and I think two or three of them were exploitable and, and, and big bugs. So this kind of sent me down the path of improving this harnessing and, and so on and so forth. So I did what I consider to be that crash amplification stuff uh, from a previous slide for Chrome. So I wrote a custom allocator. I saved the full state of the stack on every allocate and free. 
And in this case, the Chrome stack was like 300K. So my Chrome, like you think your Chrome uses a lot of RAM. This was using like 50 gigs of RAM to run one tab in Chrome. But it was really cool to have that information because I was able to go back and at any point of any allocation or any free, I was able to figure out the whole program state. In this case, I was running a debug build, so all of the variables were saved to the stack. So I was able to see at every function and every allocate and every free in that whole call stack what all the variable states looked like. This was amazing for triage. Uh, I had a lot of improvements and changes to make to the allocator, so I made it modular, put it in a DLL so I didn't have to rebuild Chrome every time. Um, it also didn't reuse virtual addresses, so PageHeap does. So if you were to allocate something and it gives you leap back as the memory, then you free that memory and allocate again, you might get leap again. So it's actually possible with PageHeap, which is you know, that protective you know, layer that's supposed to make crashes happen more, you still can potentially have something like a use after free uh, not cause a crash. So the goal of, here, uh, of this was to make sure that any time you had a use after free or uninitialized memory use, it would always crash. Um, and it kind of worked out. So then I moved on to a little bit more ambitious things. This is a screen cap from a YouTube video that I'll link in below that's like six hours long or something like that. But I had a really big interest in OS development back when I was in high school or, or whatever. And I had a mentor who kind of helped me along and learned these OS dev fundamentals. And this put me in a different mindset for development meant where I was pretty comfortable using an OS for willy-nilly things. I was comfortable going in and just saying, oh, I need to solve this problem. Uh, how about writing a new OS for it? And it sounds really sophisticated, but these are really crappy OSs. Like, there's nothing, nothing crazy going on here. But something I always wanted to do was write a hypervisor, write something that used SVM on AMD or uses VTX on Intel to create these isolated um, uh, virtual machines. And I remember, I think I still have like a printed out section of the Intel manual of how the VTX stuff worked. And I tried to read it on a plane ride when I was like 18 or 19. Had no idea what any of it meant. It was so clueless. So here I was a couple years later, I picked up the manual and somehow it made sense. Even though I never actually learned this stuff, it just, I learned the terminology or probably just learned how to read manuals a little bit better. So I wrote this, uh, this hypervisor that allowed you to run an application that was snapshotted from Windows. So I'd use a debugger to create a memory snapshot and a register snapshot, load it up in this VM, and run it through. And what's pretty cool is I have a YouTube video that was from like a week after or probably a day after of when I actually wrote it which is really cool to kind of see like what I thought it was doing at the time and I was wrong, but whatever. It kind of worked. It was, it was pretty meh. So I went on to improve this to make it fuzz a whole system. Instead of fuzzing an individual application, I wanted to take a snapshot of a whole system, you know, Windows, everything under it, all the applications, so I could run an application, it could do a syscall, return back, so on and so forth, all under this hypervisor where I'm gathering this introspection information and this coverage information. I had a really big breakthrough here, which was in the Intel page tables, or in this case, it was the VTX page tables. Um, they store these dirty bits. It basically tells you the, the processor in hardware updates when certain memory regions have been accessed. Uh, and further, it tells you when they've been accessed and modified. And this allowed me to take my, in this case, I was using like 4 to 16 gig VMs. And when you run a fuzz case, typically it's a second or a couple milliseconds, depending on what you're doing. And it's not using all 4 gigs of memory. It's usually touching maybe 100K or a meg or maybe 10 megs in an extreme example. And when I went through these page tables, the processor basically told me, hey, these are the things you need to restore. Here are the things that actually have been modified. And this is a huge speed up. If you can imagine, restoring 16 gigs every single time you want to reset your fuzzer is a lot harder than resetting one meg. So this is a really big uh, performance speed up, and it's something I kept around. I wrote another hypervisor called Grilled Cheese. Oh yeah, the previous one was written in assembly, and I open sourced it uh, like two months ago. 
So if you want to read that source, it's horrible, but it's there. Then I made something called grilled cheese, which is basically just brownie but written in C because I got a little bit more sane. I, op I also open sourced this. Uh, at the time, I was looking at Word RTF, I think was the wor uh, first thing I was trying to find, uh, trying to find bugs in. Uh, RTF is just a document file format. It's nothing too fancy, all text-based, pretty boring. Uh, I also fuzzed Windows Defender before Project Zero did because I was cooler than them. And I had a bunch of different ways of gathering code coverage. As I mentioned before, I did a whole presentation on this. So if you want to uh, see what those different ways are, first of all, feel free to ask me or DM me on Twitter. Like I'm pretty responsive. Uh, but also you can uh, look through these other slides. I did some other things to speed things up. I looked at Chrome again. I looked at some PDF parsers. But eh, whatever. So that was kind of what those tools were. But I didn't really go into why fuzzing with a hypervisor and, and what I'm doing. So first, I had two different modes of this hypervisor. One was to take this snapshot, figure out what the system was doing. And another one was to actually fuzz. So the first thing is we need to get that snapshot. We have to figure out the memory state and the register state of the whole system. So I had this snapshot mode, which was an actual if def in my code, so I had to rebuild it when I want to take a snapshot and fuzz. But that aside, uh, I booted my hypervisor over Pixie, which is just over the network. It could also boot over USB if you wanted. And then it just booted what was ever installed on the disk under the hypervisor. So if you have Linux installed on the disk, if you have Windows installed on the disk, it doesn't really matter. It'll just boot up under my hypervisor. And in the snapshot mode, all of the hardware devices are just directly passed through. This had some cool benefits of that. It was just like you were using your actual system, except this very thin hypervisor was sitting on top. So if you wanted to cheat at a game, not saying I ever used a hypervisor to cheat at games, but you were able to get your GPU passed through, and it wasn't like you're sitting in QMU and you can't really boot a game because it's too slow. So I had a kind of cool mode of gathering the snapshot. Uh, I set magic, uh, this magic value in a hardware register that you could set up. It's just a hardware breakpoint. So using GDB or WinBag, you can fill in these hardware registers, put this magic value in, and then on the next breakpoint that occurs when that value is there, the hypervisor sees, oh, this magic value is here. That means it's time to snapshot. I take the snapshot, send it over the network, reboot, and then I go into fuzz mode. Fuzz mode downloads that thing I just take, took the, the snapshot, loads it back up, sets all the context up as how it was when I took the snapshot, and continues executing from, from where I was. And in a lot of cases, where I would take the snapshot was directly after where the a uh, file was read. So like you had a file, you just returned from read file, it returned a certain amount of bytes and the contents of the file. And I would just go through and my snapshot was right afterwards. I would modify the input and the, the size of the input and just let it continue executing. Uh, once the VM crashed or timed out or ended up returning from whatever parser you had or the parser exited, I would continue on from there. Uh, and reset the VM using that dirty page thing. So another cool thing I did, which I'm going to kind of gloss over, is I'd use multiple snapshots. So I'd take a bunch of different snapshots from different states, feed inputs through kind of in, not actually in parallel, but feed them through, uh, feed the same input through all different snapshot states. And this allowed me to see different crashes in different states and kind of link them together. If it's the same input and it crashes in three different ways in different states, I assume that those three crashes are related, and I kind of build these sets. This was really important for Word because Word had so many bugs that I didn't even know where my bugs were. In this case, I had, I think it was like three or four bugs that gave um, complete control of the program counter. So effectively, I had four billion unique bugs, two to the 32. So it wasn't really useful to know that information. Then we kind of go on to the next thing. I was doing a lot of Android work at this point. So all my x86 hypervisor stuff was, I, I didn't throw it in the trash, but I just moved it to the side. So I started just adding hooks to QMU to gather that code coverage, similar to what you do with AFL. I had some issues. Uh, QMU's MMU is not designed, or really there aren't many tools out there that are designed to reset VMs over and over. You know, if you're in VMware and you hit <laughs> 
restore snapshot, it takes a couple seconds. And in the case of fuzzing, I want to do that thousands of times per second. So I ripped out their MMU, which is just how they map all their memory and how they manage all this memory, put my own in that's meant for fuzzing. It's a little bit slower for runtime, but it's a lot faster for resetting the VMs. And I continued on. But since I rewrote this MMU, I was able to change whatever this MMU did or whatever happened when the program would actually access memory. So in this case, I put in ASAN level protections. I put in byte level granularity on the pages. And now when I saw an allocate, so I put a breakpoint on allocate in the application, when I saw it allocate 34 bytes, I would make sure that I only actually gave it permission for 34 bytes. In most situations, that number is rounded up, and there's a bunch of things where you can go out of bounds. And in this case, it trimmed it down so it would force a crash if you went out of bounds a couple bytes in either direction. This is really huge. Uh, similar to ASAN and the code coverage stuff, uh, it's really important to get byte level if you can in, in some way or another. Uh, in this case, I was able to find some bugs that crashed because they are one byte out of bounds. And then after a little bit of human analysis, I was able to figure out that these bugs actually could go further out of bounds but just having that initial um, uh, input of this caused some weird state to happen, it allowed a human to step in and have enough time to figure out what was actually going on. So then I ditched QMU because it wasn't designed for fuzzing. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. I wrote a really, really, really bad emulator. But its goal was basically to just run everything literally as it happens on the processor. Not accurately to the processor, but if you update uh, memory or update registers, those registers get updated in my emulator directly. That means I could go in a breakpoint and I could observe what actually happened uh, very quickly, whereas in something like QMU, they're usually lifting the blocks, they're abstracting this information away, and sometimes if you hit an arbitrary breakpoint, the register state might not be in sync with their IL lifted state, and things can get kind of kind of silly. So I made this to just be simple and naive, it was meant so I could gather as much information about the target as possible, but there was really no perf things I did for it. I eventually added JIT, which made it a bit faster, but it was still a lot slower than QMU. Since I had this new ability to gather a lot more coverage than I previously had, I added something called register coverage, which is code coverage, but for register states. This had some serious issues. It, it, you just had like infinite amount of unique activities that were going on. So it wasn't that successful. Uh, at this point, I converted all my tools to Rust. Anyone use Rust here? Anyone program in Rust? It's a great programming language. I'm not being paid by Rust to give this message. Write your stuff in Rust. It's like C and C++, but safe. So. Now we're kind of on to what I started in early 2017 and what I'm currently working on. And I'm starting blogs of kind of going through. I just had an introduction blog on this. It was called Vectorized Emulation. Effectively, if you've ever used vectorized instructions, these are like the SSE instructions, the crazy SIMD big long name instructions. These allow the processor to do mathematical operations on multiple pieces of data. So say you want to add eight numbers to eight different numbers, the processor has an instruction where you can just add those eight numbers in one instruction uh, to all the other eight numbers. So you're able to do all these operations at the same time. In this case, I was looking at AVX 512, which is pretty rare. It's starting to become in silicon now, but I had some like obscure, not super compute. It was just one node, but it was very specialized equipment for this. But I effectively was able to run 16 32-bit VMs per core or 8 64-bit VMs per core. And in this case, it's a 64-core system with 256 hardware threads. So I was running 4,000 VMs on one machine at a time. I was able to get some crazy performance numbers in best case and, and pretty good performance numbers in average case. But when I'm looking at a small target like an image parser that's looking at a small 1K input, I'm usually getting 100,000 or more fuzz cases per second. I also pretty much kept all the tech from previous tools in here, the byte level stuff. Uh, and then I added memory and register coverage back in. And the reason I could do this memory and register coverage is now I had differential coverage. Since I was running 16 VMs in parallel, 
I was able to figure out when the VMs did something different very cheaply. I could look to their neighbors and say, if someone is doing something different than what you're doing, then you're able to kind of save that as a unique state because the only thing that can change in this environment is things from user input. So effectively, I'm now only recording coverage on register states that were influenced by the user input, not just all register state in general. And this dramatically reduced the amount of register coverage I had to gather, and it made it feasible, unlike before when it was just an infinite amount of things to look at. I also added some uh, uninitialized memory tracking. So when I do an allocation, I would mark the memory as this is not initialized. I use something called read after write. So effectively, you could only read the memory that was marked raw uh, after it had been written to. So you get this allocation. It's just some random stuff from the, the heap. And you couldn't actually read this information without faulting until it's been written to. And once again, this is byte level just like everything else. So if you were to write one byte in a buffer and then read four bytes that contains that one byte, it's still going to fault because three of the other bytes have not been updated. And this will help find things like information leakage um, and other just weird uh, uninitialized usage, usages like uh, uh, double freeze or use after freeze in certain situations. Um, finally, with the raw stuff, I was also able to fuzz portions of code. So there's kind of this tree of different things that, different contexts you have when you're fuzzing. One is you're looking at source. You have access to source. You're able to recompile it. You have other cases where you have the binary, and you can kind of reverse it out and figure out how it works and run it. And then you have other cases where everything gets really hard, where you have portions of a binary. And this can happen if you have part of a system, or for example, if you have like a phone or some lockdown embedded device where maybe you are using a, a kernel exploit to leak memory, but don't know the rest of the state of the system. You're only able to get pieces. This read after write allowed me to kind of fuzz things in that situation because I'd mark everything as uninitialized and fill it in as I needed. Finally, I added these solvers. Yeah. Uh, finally, I added these like solver-like things to the uh, to the vectorized emulation stuff. This allowed me to try to determine when I hit unique states based on this register coverage. I added something that would instrument compares, and it would find it would record these inputs based on how many bytes of the compare matched. So if you have a four-byte compare and none of the bytes matched, and inputs generated saying zero bytes matched, if one byte matches, it creates a new input. And it basically allowed me to gather this coverage and find very quickly um, ways to uh, find these magic values that need to match these four bytes or these eight bytes directly as is. So this is actual inputs that were generated from this for fuzzing. A, um, this was a HTTP parser. It doesn't look crazy sophisticated. It's not an actual HTTP protocol. But in this case, it was able to identify HTTP slash 1.1, which is an important part of the HTTP protocol. It was also able to find HTTPS colon slash slash is an interesting thing. Uh, but what's important to note here is I didn't tell it to do those things. It's just generating completely random bytes, and it was learning through different program states that these are interesting things that the program behaves differently to. Um, and in this case, code coverage was not sufficient to get these things as it was doing uh, mem compares that were doing blocked compares that were four bytes at a time, and so on and so forth. I'm going to do a whole blog post just on this one slide. So this is a reminder slide from me. I'm probably talking too fast by this point. But now we're at the important slide, which is basically where I'm at today. So WaffleCone, which is the vectorized emulator, is being rewritten. It was kind of initially a research project, and then it worked. So now it's, I'm trying to make it into a usable tool. We'll see if I succeed. Um, but when it comes to what I'm actually using when looking at targets now, for hard targets, I'm pretty much using all of my tools in different ways and trying to get creative if I need to. For medium targets, I love using the custom debugger. It's just great. It's trivial. It's simple. It just works. Uh, and for soft targets, just, just do anything. Just do anything. And then finally, what's the right solution? There's none. So 
you should always go into a target and try and figure out what specifically is happening on them and try and find something that works specifically for that target. In a lot of cases, if you go into sunk cost and you try and reuse tools that you wrote for previous things because you just happen to have the code sitting around, you might end up in situations where you end up working too hard for, for no reason. So that leads me to questions. Any questions? I have no time constraints, so if people want to grab drinks or grab food later or whatever, feel free to somehow get in contact with me. Uh, I think I'm in town until Thursday, so feel free to ask me questions now. Feel free to DM me. So, cool. Any questions? Yeah, so uh, effectively when I was trying to, in the case of taking in the snapshot, I used the debug registers. I think it was like DR1, which is the second address value for the debug registers. That's where I put my magic value. And then DR0 is where I put the actual location that I wanted to take the snapshot from. And when I got that trap in the hypervisor saying, you hit a, hit a breakpoint. If DR1 didn't have the magic value, I just passed it through. And then if it did have the magic value, then that was the snapshot case. Um, the CR registers I didn't really make use of in that case. Uh, obviously, I needed to use them to create the hypervisor, but I didn't really use them for introspection in any way. So, cool. So when, you're, when you're sort of setting up a new target, and how do you like deal, especially when you're talking like an operating system level type thing, how do you deal with like the fact that the operating systems are awful to emulate a lot of the time and take a lot of like time and effort? And how do you know that you're investing that effort appropriately? So typically whenever I'm looking at a target, I'm I've almost always looked at relatively like medium to hard targets, so I can justify one week or two weeks of spin-up time to figure out what I'm actually looking at. So that's usually on the application side. On the OS side, it can, yeah, it can get really tricky, uh, especially when you are running into syscalls that are touching all sorts of disk or doing things with hardware that I didn't necessarily emulate because I took the snapshot from direct pass-through hardware. So I would have to try and find ways to work around that. And, in a lot of cases, it required me to get really creative with the application. I had to figure out what it was actually trying to do, and I'd usually put breakpoints in the application on its read file, and I would try to simulate the disk without actually going into the kernel. Um, I'd love to eventually add device support to my hypervisor. I, I've always wanted to do it, and I think it'd take a month or two of work, and then I'd be able to just run systems, and I wouldn't really care what they're doing. Um, there's definitely things when fuzzing OSs where being enlightened and understanding the OS you're looking at is important. If you want to figure out information like um, where modules are and uh, just different what proce processes are running and getting these task lists and whatever. Um, so that's something I pretty much always had to do because with ASLR, your crashes are in different locations and different snapshots. So I had to normalize them in some way and I do this by walking those module lists for the system and then recording the crash as a module plus an offset and that would get rid of this ASLR issue. So the, the answer there is it's just a lot of work. <laughs> so other questions? Cool. Well, thank you for having me. I had a lot of fun being here. Thank you very much. So. I have a resources slide here, which is probably useless unless somehow I distribute the slides. Uh, I plan on just putting this recording up probably tonight. Uh, I've got a 100 megabit full duplex in my hotel somehow. So I'll probably get the video and the uh, audio and the slides uploaded tonight, and I'll tweet those out. Um, probably put them on NetSec too, so you don't even have to follow me on Twitter. Um, then I had some random points that didn't really fit in anywhere. Uh, is basically ranting about performance. Uh, fuzz cases per input is a really cool thing to look at. Figuring out how many fuzz cases you ran through for each input in your corpus. If you have 10,000 different images that you pass through to your image parser and you're getting one fuzz case a second, it's probably, you're 
probably not really doing much because you're not running through all of your inputs. So I always shoot for this arbitrary metric of every input I have. I've run through the fuzzer and mutator about 100 times. Um, and I've actually historically had some dynamic tunings of my coverage gathering to turn coverage on and off to force that number to stay at 100. So I'd start with code coverage. Code coverage would stop gaining new information. I'd turn on register coverage, turn it back off because it's overwhelming, and so on and so forth. And after a couple days, you have all your coverage turned on, and you're not getting any new state. And this tells you kind of a cool thing. You're no longer doing anything new with your fuzzer. So it gives you an objective point of when maybe it's time to change your fuzzer or change targets or, or uh, something like that. Another thing that I do um, is I restart my fuzzer from scratch every time. I don't save, I, I save all of the inputs and crashes that I get, but I usually don't restart from those states. And the reason I do that is if you always restart your fuzzer from old inputs that you have sitting around or used in previous fuzz instances, if you completely break your fuzzer, it's possible that you don't notice because you run your application, it feeds through the old inputs, which are good, and everything lines up again, and you didn't realize for the past two months your fuzzer hasn't been actually working, and if you started from scratch, it would never find those original inputs. Um, I can get away with this because I have all of my tools are based in performance, um, but I think it's something to do every once in a while to just restart your fuzzer and see how does it compare with previous instances. You know, is it getting the same coverage in the same amount of time? If it's getting coverage faster, or more coverage, you probably made an improvement, so keep working on it. Um, another thing is the little oracle crashes, the div by zeros, the null DRFs, are really cool because they kind of they give you hope. You know, you're, when you're looking at a target and you get no crashes, it really sucks. Getting a div by zero sucks because it's like not a really big bug, but at least you have a crash. Like you know you're doing something fundamentally that's weird and you're causing the program to do things it's not supposed to do. Uh, finally, optimize your stuff. Figure out if you're, if you're spending a lot of time in the kernel, figure out where your bottlenecks are, so on and so forth. These are random points. They don't really fit in anywhere else, but. Cool, that's all I have, sweet.